Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today evening. And I was worried that we got late, but then when I came here, I realized that you have powerful kirtan ears, <laughs> so I can keep you alive. So, so we got a little late. Apologies for that. And I will speak today, tomorrow, and day after on a series on the Ramayana. And I'll talk about how to improve our relationships with each other and with Krishna. I'll talk about different aspects. We'll primarily focus on some incidents from the Ramayana. Today I'll focus on Hanuman's journey to Lanka and how he dealt with the obstacles on the way. So a few months ago I was uh, in America, I was speaking at Stanford University and I spoke on the topic of make a life, not a living. So after that, there was an interesting question came, that came up. Person asked, you know, can humility and ability go together? Generally, if somebody has ability, then at one level they do become proud themselves. And even if they don't, today's world, you have to actually prop yourself up, promote yourself. One of my friends uh, is studied in IIM, which is a management institute after IIT. So quite well known. So he was telling that they got training how to boost your CV over there. Your bio is as if you're walking along a road and you see a smoke tap open and you turn off that tap. So you can add that in your CV as I am an activist for conserving water on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> so the nature of the world is that we often need to promote ourselves at one level. Because it's a competitive world. At another level, humility is seen as weakness. So, that if you're humble, then people will trample over you. People will push you around. And therefore, humility is not practical. However, humility is a power, not a weakness. It can become a weakness if we misunderstand and misapply humility. And there are many different ideas of what humility actually means. Uh, and so I will focus on three points. The first point I started, humility is not looking down at oneself. It is looking up at something bigger than oneself. Humility is not what? Looking down at oneself. Oh, I am so useless. I am so pathetic. I am good for nothing. Now, when people say like this, that can very easily go into the zone of self-pity. Where people keep feeling sorry for themselves. And ironically, self-pity is actually just the other side of, of uh, ego. Some people think I am so big, and they are self-centered that way. And some people think I am so small and they are self-centered that way. So either way, if somebody is self-centered, then that is not humility at all. So when somebody is very self-centered, then they can't stop thinking about anything except themselves. I was at a conference on psychology and spirituality recently and we're talking about how Spirituality can help promote people's mental health, not just spiritual well-being, but also mental health. So, spirituality can actually give us a deeply positive conception of ourselves. Many people externally, they act as if they are so great, they are so confident. But internally, one of the common problems that people face is self-loathing. Many people just don't like themselves. They had certain expectations of themselves. I should have achieved this. I should have done that. I should have got there. And when they're not able to achieve their dreams. They're not able to pursue their purposes. Then they start disliking themselves. And imagine if we have to, if we have to live with someone, say as a friend, as a room partner, as a, as a relative, as a spouse, whatever. And if we utterly detest that person, a life would be very, very difficult. 
And imagine if, if that happens, say, now it's very easy to understand that if you dislike someone and you have to live with them, it's going to be very difficult. But if you have to live with ourselves, always, and if we dislike ourselves, then also life becomes unlivable. And in fact, at one level, suicide is the ultimate expression of disliking oneself. Of course, suicide is a complicated phenomenon and there can be many different causes of it. But at one level, one just doesn't, one can't tolerate being in one's own life. Let me end my life. One of my friends is also a spiritual counselor. Now, in, when we counsel, uh, when we, uh, devotees interact with each other, there's a way of greeting each other. Called, Please accept my humble obeisances. It's a way of offering respects to each other. So this devotee, he told me that one of his, one of the, one of the students he was guiding, a student sent him a message. He said, "Please accept my final obeisances." <laughs> So at one level, it is a desperate attempt to call attention. <laughs> no, if you don't respond, I'm going to end my life now. <laughs> so what happens is that sometimes people just st start feeling that my life is unlivable. So to look down on oneself, to beat oneself, to loathe oneself, that is not humility. That is, we could say, frustrated false ego. I want to be great, but there's nothing about me that is great. So what do I do? And I feel bad about myself. So humility is not looking down at oneself. Humility is looking up. What did I say? Remember? Looking up at something bigger than ourselves. Yes, looking up at something bigger than ourselves. Our culture is often is especially as we are becoming westernized modernized or of course say post modernized now now we are all very centered on rights and victimhood that means that everybody claims this is my right this is my right this is my right and whenever somebody is deprived of something people feel i was victimized you know this person did like this to me this person betrayed me this person cheated me, this person did like this to me, this person abused me. And now, now of course, to be victimized is, it can, it can, it's very painful, it can be tragic, it can live lifelong, leave lifelong scars. But quite often, you know, we may be, we may have, we may be, we may get scars in life, but we don't have to obsess over those scars. So we may be, we may be victimized, but we don't have to be victims. When we keep obsessing with us, oh, this terrible thing happened with me, this terrible thing happened with me, this terrible thing happened with me, then that simply makes things worse. So why I'm talking about this is that on one side, we often uh, feel that we have certain rights. I think this person should not have done like this to me. This should not have happened like that. So the idea is that this is how it should have happened. This is the right way things should have been done, but they did like this. And that's what we consider as a deprivation of our rights. So yes, there we all have certain rights and rights need to be protected. But no, actually speaking, everybody gets victimized sooner or later. And what will help us grow, what will help us find fulfillment in life is not getting our rights, but taking up our responsibilities. Responsibility, sometimes the word can have a negative connotation. But responsibility simply means that we take up something worthwhile in our life. The responsibility can be even to ourselves. I have certain talents. I have certain abilities. I have certain inspirations. And I want to do something with my life. So all of us have certain weaknesses. All of us have certain strengths. Either we can keep complaining about our weaknesses or we can keep complaining about the obstacles that we are facing. Uh, the bar, or we can look at whatever strengths that we have and we can look at the opportunities that we have. But you know, just having gifts is not enough. Just having strengths is not enough. We have to take responsibility to use them, to develop them. Some people say that I have many hidden talents. The problem is they are hidden even from me. <laughs> <laughs> they are hidden even from me. 
So what happens? In my thinking that, oh, I should have some other talent which I don't have and dreaming about it and long craving for it. That doesn't just help us much right now. So taking responsibility means that, okay, I'm in this situation. How can I make the best of this situation? So in one sense, uh, you know, fighting about what is wrong. Yes, we can do that and we can try to correct it. But sometimes just the world is a cruel place. The life is tough and things can go wrong. Things can go terribly wrong. And I travel across the world and I talk with people. And even people who are very successful in the world's eyes, if you scrap, scrap a little below the surface, everybody is working through their own tragedies. Somebody has lost a loved one. Somebody is, is going through a painful separation. Somebody's parents are having some uh, Alzheimer's and they can't even recognize them. Somebody has just uh, lost a child. Somebody has been through betrayal by someone. So many, so many ways life, could, life can treat us very badly at times. So, actually speaking, if we want to feel sorry for ourselves, even the rest of our whole remaining life is not enough to feel sorry for ourselves. For all of us, many things have gone wrong. But that doesn't help us in any constructive way. If we look at the example of Srila Prabhupada, the, uh, he is this great saint who founded, who brought Krishna Bhakti to the West. And Literally, so many things went wrong. He tried to start a business and it was not even for his own aggrandizing. It was for the purpose of sharing a spiritual mission with the world. Spiritual message with the world. For assisting his spiritual teacher in sharing spiritual message with the world. And what happened? The, his business repeatedly, he tried and repeatedly somebody betrayed him. A fire came up somewhere. It just didn't work. He tried to start a magazine. Put his whole effort into on the magazine. Nobody was interested. Nobody was interested. He was walking on the streets of Delhi and suddenly a cow hit him. So knocked over and he fell unconscious over there. No one to help him. He tried to start an organization in this Indian city, Jhansi. And the same people who were supporting him turned against him. And the place which was going to be his international headquarters, he was left with no quarter over there. He was told to leave from there. And I can just go on and on. Many, many things. He finally decided to come to America. And he, he didn't have any money to come to America, so he went to a potential sponsor. And she said, Swamiji, you are so old and America is so cold. <laughs> <laughs> so how will you, you will die over there? You cannot live over there. Prabhupada said that if I have to die, let me die pursuing my mission. So nothing is going to happen to me. God will protect me. He got a, on a cargo ship and there also, what happened? He got a heart attack. Not one, but two heart attacks. If you look at his life, if you have to complain, there's so many reasons, far, far more than most of us, what we have to face. So many things went wrong. But his focus was not on seeking rights. Why is this happening? Why is this person doing like this? His focus was on responsibility. The responsibility was, I want to share the spiritual wisdom of ancient India. I want to share the message of divine love. And it is you know, responsibility that keeps us oriented. The sense of meaning comes in our life to the extent we take up some responsibility bigger than us. As long as we just obsessed with our own mind, I am feeling like this or this person did like this. We, just, we can just go on and on and on with that. So that's why uh, this was two parts I talked about. Humility doesn't mean looking down at ourselves. It means looking up at something bigger than ourselves. Looking up at something bigger than ourselves means looking, taking up some responsibility. Now, okay, this is what where I am at. These are my roles. These are my abilities. These are my obligations. How can I take responsibility? And when we do this, we'll find that just the attitude of taking up a response, looking up at something bigger than ourselves, can infuse some positivity within us, infuse some energy within us, infuse some sense of direction and accomplishment within us. Even if we are not able to 
take much steps forward just that attitude let me take responsibility this is a situation i am in what is the best that i can do with this situation so any i this is the first point i wanted to speak any questions or comments about this we'll have this class in three parts and after each part we can have some either reflections or questions anything at this stage so responsibility is a goal that's what it's like. some purpose that's what you mean and responsibility purpose. yes this is responsibility mean purpose yes of course so responsible responsibility and purpose are very closely related say for example if somebody is driving a car and the car is old and noisy and slow and difficult to drive but okay this is the only car i have so now if i had to go somewhere this is the only car i have to use so take responsibility means drive the car as well as you can and purpose means okay where do i want to go and now we all have a body and mind everyone has some pain some or the other painful inadequacies now we may not look good enough we may not speak smart enough we may not have a sharp enough memory we may not have this we may not have that everyone has some painful inadequacies but we have to take this is the body and the mind that i have this is the situation i am in how can i take responsibility for it? and where do i want to go with this so the purpose is very important suppose you know you see a neighbor is coming out rushing out of their home and going to the car you say where are you going to oh i am going to the gas station to fuel my car okay but where are you going oh well, then after that i will go to the next gas station oh okay but after that, where will you go and then i go to the next gas station no but where are you driving he says i am driving to fuel my car that's too big is it <laughs> okay so what we car definitely needs fuel but a fuel the fuel the gas in the car is what we drive with that's not what we drive for is a difference between what we live with and what we live for so most often in in a materialistic world view that that's you know, the question has brought me to second point shall come to now in a materialistic world view people mistake people mistake what we live with with what we live for so let me now all of us basically have four bodily drives now we are we are our bodies are biological machines and they need uh, to eat they need to rest uh, we are a species who tend to reproduce and then we have to protect ourselves so we seek power so food sleep sex and power these you could say broadly speaking are what we drive with hmm? but what do you drive for so if we don't have any higher purpose beyond just looking for the next round of eating sleeping mating or defending then that is like living simply to fuel the uh, to uh, fuel the car and that soon makes that's not a worthy purpose it will soon strip our life of me now a ga- the gas is vital for driving a car but there is a difference between the means and the purpose so we are so we are so caught with the a materialistic only what it does it it makes us so infatuated with the means that we make the means itself into the purpose now money is very important in life to have money to have no money is painful but to have only money is even more people to have a if somebody while trying climbing on to the top has trampled over others has alienated others and people are there people have become their enemies and people are suspicious of them and they may have a big house but the big house only gives them the privilege of a lot of space in which to feel lonely does it provide anything to them anything meaningful anything joyful so a purpose refers to something bigger than us it's not just the not just the satisfaction of our bodily needs or bodily drives and that purpose is provided by spiritual understanding so the bhagavad gita explains that every one of us is a soul and as a soul we are a part of the whole that whole is god is known by different names in different traditions the bhagavad gita knows him by the name krishna the broad bhakti tradition has named the krishna ram vishnu 
various names. And we are all on a multi-life journey of spiritual evolution. So our evolution is in wisdom and in maturity. Wisdom refers to intellectual growth. Maturity refers to emotional growth. Wisdom means if you don't have wisdom, then we are very short-sighted. If you don't have maturity, small things, they just shake us up so much. I was just in Toronto, so I was talking with one devotee couple. So the 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 Mataji is a the lady is a lawyer over there. So she she's family she has family law. So she say that she gets cases of people who just quarrel over utter trifles. She said that she was with someone and a lady came to him and she says. I want to say, this is why. He said that, oh, because my partner came into the restroom and he came into the our, our restroom and he used my toothpaste without my permission. <laughs> now, is that a reason to separate? Yeah, what happens is that sometimes, of course, that's probably not the whole story. That is a trigger. But still, you have to have perspectives. So sometimes we can just if. We want to find what is wrong. We can take the smallest fault and make it so big. So we need some bigger purpose. And spiritual wisdom, what it tells us is that we are on on a multi-life journey of evolution, and we need to grow in our spiritual understanding. Ultimately, our capacity to love. Ultimately, our love is meant to be directed towards the divine. And then, when it is directed towards the divine, it gets. It gets channeled towards everyone else in relationship with the divine, and this is so. For that evolution, we all have been given certain abilities. So the abilities we use to grow spiritually and also to contribute socially. Now, while doing this, if we lose a sense of perspective, then we get swept away. So, our purpose is ultimately. To grow spiritually, to grow in wisdom, to grow in maturity, and that is what you know. How much we have grown internally, that is the only thing that is going to last with us. We can acquire a lot of wealth, we can acquire a lot of fame, we can get a lot of position, and these are useful as far as success in the world is concerned. But none of these can, in times of distress, themselves provide us strength, provide us satisfaction. It is how much we have grown in wisdom, how much. Our vision has grown to look at something bigger than ourselves and to focus on that, to become absorbed in that. That is what is going to give us lasting satisfaction. So, <clears throat> this purpose. Let me share a story from the Ramayana about this. And <clears throat> so, uh, so the Ramayana is an ancient epic which describes Ram Ayan. Ayan means journey. So, the journey of Ram. And in that epic, Hanuman is a prominent devotee and servitor of Ram. So he has to go in search for Sita. And as he is searching for Sita, he has to go across a across the Indian Ocean. And while he is is leapt across and is going through the ocean, at that time he meets these various obstacles. So he is on the mission to find Sita for Ram. And as he's going, suddenly along the way, he finds that some giant form is rising, is rising, rising. And then he looks at it and sees that it looks like a, it looks like a giant female person. Giant female. He says, "Who are you?" He says, "He's a little taken aback." And he looks at her and she's that lady says, "I am Sibika." She says, "I have got the benediction." That because I live in the ocean, I got a benediction from the gods that whoever passes along this way, they will be my food. Nobody can escape without entering into my mouth. Uh, so uh, she is huge. So Hanuman, he just he has shape shifting abilities. So when he sees this demoness and his oh, mouth is wide open, so he he, he expands his expands his size. And when he expands his size, she expands her mouth, and then he expands his size further, and she enlarges her mouth further, 
And it goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And at this point, it is just going on and this Hanuman's ability seems to be, is unlimited and this demon, this demoness ability also seems to be unlimited. He's opening her mouth, opening her mouth and he's also enlarging his size. At that point, Hanuman's intelligence comes into picture. His point over there recognizes my point is not to defeat this demon. It's my not point is not to prove my power that I am greater than this demon. My point, my purpose here is to go to find Sita. So he immediately uses his shape shifting ability and he shrinks his form. And he shrinks his form and he becomes so tiny. And as soon as he becomes tiny, he just rushes into her mouth. And goes deep into her mouth. And before she can understand what is happening. Now if your mouth is very big. Say if a door is very very big. Then even if you want to close the door. Closing the door will take time. The small door you can close it quickly. So after Hanuman has gone inside the mouth. She realizes what is there. So she, before she can even understand what is happening. Start closing the mouth. Hanuman goes deep inside and comes out. And he says. The benediction from the God has been honored. So please let me go ahead. And now. Here she realized that he has been out, she has been outsmarted. And then she reveals, she changes her form and she reveals that actually he's not a demoness, but he's a goddess. And she has been sent by the god to test Hanuman. So it is it's, it's to test Hanuman, one of his names is that Buddhimatam Varishtam. He is the greatest among intelligent people. So what is what that this test particularly was about is intelligence. Now, how intelligent is he? So, intelligence here means to focus on the purpose. So, I'll, I'll, I said I'll talk about three, three points in this class. So, second, first I said is about humility, one aspect of humility. Second aspect of humility is humility means to not let our ego come in the way of our purpose. Humility means to not let our ego come in the way of our purpose. So, how dare you challenge me? Sometimes we may face opponents, but our purpose is not to defeat an opponent. Our purpose is to reach the destination. So, now Anumana would have said, you know, who do you think you are? I am so powerful. But his, purpose, his point over there was not to prove his power. His point was to pursue his purpose. So, for, so do not let our ego come in the way of our purpose. Now, what happens in today's world? Most people don't have any meaningful purpose to their lives. We can get lost in two ways. It's say sometimes some people are driving a car and they are lost. And when they are lost, they may repeat look at the GPS. They may stop and ask someone. Some people are so lost that they don't even know they are lost. So they are driving smoothly and they don't know where they are driving. Now, such people are very, very lamentably lost. So some people don't know what is their purpose in life and they're looking for some purpose. Some people don't know what is the purpose and they have simply just going, chasing whichever is the next pleasure that comes along the way. And that becomes their purpose. So those people are so lost that they don't even know that they don't know the purpose. So if we don't have anything to live for, if we don't have any meaningful purpose to fight for, <clears throat> it's not that we will stop fighting. If we don't have anything to fight for, we will fight for anything. That means what? If we don't have anything meaningful in life, anything worthwhile that we live for, that we fight for, that we strive for, then any small grievance, any small slight, any small agitation, that will make it very big. So sometimes people start quarreling and they quarrel about such small, small things. So whenever we find that in some relationships, uh, some issues are escalating, some things are going out of control, quite often it starts from something very small. And one person feels slighted and they get angry. And when they get angry and they speak some words in anger, the other person feels angry. How dare you speak like this to me? And then the other person speaks something further. 
And quite often, when two people get angry, they just aggravate a small thing into a very big thing. And often the small thing is lost and this person speaks this accusation, this person that speaks that accusation and that person speaks that thing and then it's from a small push you can have a world war happening. So it's like small things become big. When now we all have an ego, we can't deny it. Uh, all of us want to be respected and all of us would like to be uh, popular, famous, appreciated, praised. But if that itself becomes our purpose, if we have something meaningful to do, and while doing that, if we are appreciated, that is good. But if we don't have that, then what happens? Every small thing becomes very big. It doesn't, not every small thing has, will become big. But any small thing can suddenly become big. So when some people are very immature and unstable, we don't know what will trigger them. Broadly, there are two kinds of people. Some people can be very predictable. Some people can be very unpredictable. Now, both is not very pleasant. If somebody is entirely predictable, then living with them is like living with a robot. Now, I say this, they will say this. I ask this, they will say this. Like when you press a button, this is going to be a response. So life becomes very predictable and boring. But if somebody is entirely unpredictable, then having a relationship with them is like walking through a landmine. We just take one step, nothing happens. Then we take another step, boom! What happened? It just becomes very difficult to work with such people. So it, it, all of us, if we see, there has to be some structure, some order, some predictability. Now. Life itself is a combination, you could say, of order and chaos. Some things are orderly, some things are disorderly. So if there is no order at all, then life becomes chaotic. If, on the other hand, there is only order, then it becomes totalitarian. I have no spontaneity, no freedom. So we need both. But the point I am making over here is that when people have no order, no predictability, then they can make small things very big. So we need, humility means, second thing was what? To keep a focus. But what specifically what I say? To not let, let our ego come in the way of our purpose. Yes, thank you. And third point I'll talk and then we can have some questions. But any questions about this at this stage? Yeah. How far we can be, uh, how far we can predict and uh, how long we can unpredict things? There should be some limitation. We should be both like predictable and unpredictable. Yeah. So how long we can judge ourselves during according to the situations? Judge ourselves or judge others? Judge ourselves. I mean, how, how far we can control ourselves? How long we can predict and how long we can unpredict Okay. So how much can we control ourselves and behave in a predictable way? Mm. And how, when can we sort of, when we go out of control and behave in an unpredictable way? There is a, living with ourselves is a, a dynamic dance between self-discovery and self-discipline. There is an aspect of self-discipline. This is what I plan to do and this is what I am going to do. But, you know, we cannot be our own masters. We can say, everything that I plan, I'll be able to do it. It just doesn't work like that. Recently, I was invited for a, a talk show, TV talk show on New Year resolutions. So I did some studies. So I found that almost 80 to 90% of people's New Year resolutions are not new. <laughs> they made those resolutions, but somehow they couldn't keep them. So, you know, we cannot be entirely into self-discipline. It just doesn't work. But we cannot be entirely into self-discovery. Self-discovery means, you know, okay, I wake up today, let's see what I do today. What do you mean? <laughs> you should have some plan. Now, everything may not go according to our plan, but that doesn't mean there should be no plan at all. So, it's like, say, if you are working with someone, so we can't order them around, but we at the same time can't be ordered around by them. So, we negotiate. So, it's, it's like that, it's like we need to we treat ourselves like someone we care about. 
and then there is some aspect where we negotiate this is what you have to do no matter how you feel do it so that is the control part if something is again this is determined by our purpose if for our purpose something is important no matter how we feel we do it but some things okay if it's just not compatible let me see okay what works for me? how can i move forward so there is the aspect of self discovery also yeah okay while doing this i feel like i feel terrible while doing this by doing this oh, it works very well i didn't know i could do this so well so it's it's both self discovery and self discipline and we can't really control that but broadly if we have a purpose that purpose gives us a framework by which this is very important for me this is important this is not that important and that framework can help us to balance between self discovery and self discipline you answer your question thank okay. you okay so the last point now and uh, humility means to not take others actions personally humility means to not take others actions personally what do i mean by this that actually i was giving a class on, in new york on the same topic of sensitivity sentimentality and spirituality similar direction similar theme was going on so i mentioned this point and then there was a american lady she said an experience she said that she had gone to a supermarket and then there was somebody who was behind her was making like incoherent sounds speaking something incoherently so she was busy she didn't she didn't uh, want to get distracted she was just going on bike and suddenly she felt like a thak a big slap on her face she got angry she turned around she turned around and looked at the person <coughs> and she realized this is a young man but he was with a caregiver and he was dyslexic so he had dyslexia and what had happened basically was that in his own dyslexic way he was trying to attract her attention so just rather than taking it personally he said this he just looked at her looked at him smiled nodded and go and you know there was is because i smiled at him was i satisfied i moved on. i could have got angry at that time so now inside every every complaining adult is a crying infant when people complain against us complain about they they hurt us they injure us they attack us at that time often they say how could you speak like this about me how can you think like this about me? we can take it personally but inside but you know they are in some ways they have some need they have some uh, they have some need that has not been fulfilled and they are flailing to try to get that need fulfilled so in an infant if an infant cries in, at midnight the mother doesn't mother may not be pleased to be woken up like that but the mother doesn't get angry with that so the infant is just in fact is not crying because it enjoys crying the infant is crying because it has some distress and then you address the distress the mobile is also like an infant that cries you know <laughs> it also <laughs> yeah so now to not take others actions personally means that when people people mistreat us people insult us most of the times it's not about us everybody has a movie going on in their head and in that movie they are the stars and everybody else is an extra <laughs> everybody else is an extra so in the movie that is going on in their head they are doing something they are responding to something and we just happen to be there when they respond i come from india and india is a cricket mad country mm-hmm. so i was in america at university i spoke about cricket and it was sometime all the audience it was americans they were all looking at me as if they were here they were watching a foreign language movie with no subtitles <laughs> 
<laughs> then somebody told me that actually for many people in the west uh, cricket first signifies an insect then a game <laughs> so i'm talking about the game cricket so right now uh, india i said india is a cricket mad country and the cricket world cup is going to start soon so the cricket mania as it speak so i have seen sometimes in india what happens uh, young young people and they may walking on the streets and they are swinging their hands either they are swinging imagine that i am hitting a big sixer or i am bowling and making somebody clean bowl or whatever now if you look around there is no ground there is no bat there is no ball is walking on the street <laughs> but what is happening there is a cricket match going on in their head and in that cricket match they are the stars <laughs> <laughs> and what is going on in their head in their minds is being played out at the physical level so they are moving their hands they are moving their legs they are they do everything so that is quite graphic and it is unusual but all of us there is a movie going on in our head and often there are so many things happening inside that we don't even know what is going on in anyone's head so even when people respond to people treat us improperly they hurt us they anger us and quite often it is not about us and instead of taking their actions personally if we can just move forward and try to understand what is their need now it does not mean that we have to address everyone's need and we say what about my need who is going to address that yeah that's a valid question but the point is sometimes you may say this person's need i can't address that mm-hmm. a few weeks ago uh, one devotee told me that you have no emotions now i was a little taken aback but because because i had spent a lot of time with them and i tried to connect with them quite well then i i was still like why were they speaking like this and then it struck me i thought that actually more than how I, I, i what happened that thing happened and the next day i went for a program and after that i was talking with the people for quite some time and then my host is in australia i was in australia in, in adelaide so the host told me that you know, all the audience was so happy you spent so much time you were so attentive to everyone's needs so like two completely opposite things then i started thinking about it but what it means is that often people's response to us is a function of their expectation from us so if i'm just going for a program if i just spend some time talking to people people feel good but if somebody has too high expectations from us then all that it means is that rather than taking their their statement personally it just means that they have emotional needs that i can't take that i and that i'm not meeting presently now it's up to me to decide whether i i need to extend myself and meet their needs or i need to step back and say that i i personally i cannot meet this need so that's up to me but so what happens is so, so the point i think is humility means to not take others actions personally when people mistreat us often it is not much about us there's something going on in their head and we happen to be there as as the unfortunate recipients of whatever is going on in their head but that doesn't mean we have to be victims but when we don't take it personally then we can respond more maturely okay this is if we try to understand what is their need and try to meet their need or we may decide that i can't meet this need and we step back at least what will happen by this is we would aggravate things because what happens because of their unaddressed need they speak something and then we counter that and they counter us and we counter them and then oh everything gets lost everything just gets aggravated and lost so humility if we understand it this way it can help us to keep small things small it is not that as i said some people feel humility means people will trample over us that's possible if we misunderstand humility if we think humility means always letting other people have their way then that is not humility is it we have to be purpose centered this is what i want to do in my life this is important and if somebody doesn't respect me still i'll tolerate that if i want to move forward but if somebody stops me from moving forward itself then that is not humility and if i let them stop me then it's not it's not humility it is passivity and it can even be stupidity if i think it's humility i'll conclude with one example and then you can have some questions i suppose we are and uh, we are going in a 
local or a metro train. Do you have metro here in metro. Metro here over here? In India, we call it locals. So India has a huge population. So that might be a metro uh, local train with a compartment meant for 50 people and then 300 people inside. Everybody squeezed together. And say some people in every community, every group of people, there will be some people who will be bullies. There are always all kinds of characters. So suppose somebody, the person standing next to us is a bully. And we are standing there, standing, but he's like pushing us. <laughs> and he said, how dare you push him? You think you are so strong? I'll show you how strong I am. <laughs> and he started pushing them. And they push us. And we push them. And they push us. And we push them. And we get so caught in pushing each other that our destination comes and goes and we are still pushing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is, is losing perspective. That's foolishness. So, okay, you want to be a bully, you want to push. It's a small thing. It doesn't matter where I stand. I can just move aside somewhere. It's a short journey. I can stand somewhere else. So keep small things small. Hmm? But imagine if that person, instead of just pushing us, they start pushing us out of the train itself. <laughs> then we can't tolerate like that. So then make us take a stand. Either we have to ask others for call others for help. We call the security or the authorities. Or you might decide I'll move somewhere else. So, the important thing is, humility doesn't mean that for us, if we are pushed out of the train, then we don't get to our destination. And that is a big thing for us. So, humility means that we, we don't let the ego come in the way of our purpose. But if something is coming in the way of our purpose, we have to take a stand. We take a stand and that's how we move forward. So, we won't let ourselves... Uh, in the name of humility, let others walk over us because we want to walk towards that destination. We want to go towards that destination. So when we have this understanding of humility, we will keep focus on the big things and small things. We let them pass. If big things come in, if if some of the big things are obstructed, then we will take a strong stand. And that strong stand is also not based on opposing that person, you know, but it is on pursuing our purpose. And when we have that attitude, then what will happen is that gradually, as we respect our purpose and pursue our purpose, we will earn real respect from people. Sometimes some people just, why don't you respect me? Why don't you respect me? Why don't you respect me? It's, it's, you know, if we just demand respect, it doesn't work so well. It's, what is this? If we have something important that we respect and we pursue, and then we set the boundaries. You know, this I'm not going to. This this you cannot transgress. Then what happens? We we give space for them to exercise whatever they want to do, but we don't let them encroach completely in our space. So our purpose helps us to set boundaries. And if we don't have a purpose, then either we have no boundaries, so others people encroach on us completely, or nobody knows where the boundaries are. And then every small thing can become very big. So our purpose helps us to set the boundaries. Right? With those boundaries, then we understand this is this is something which I'm going to take a stand on. This is not worth it. Okay, if you feel that is so important for you, you do it, let's do it your way. And that way we can move forward in our life while also pursuing our relationships in a mature way. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on the topic of relationships and especially the role of humility in relationships. And I talked about three aspects of humility. The first was, does anyone remember? Yeah? Humility is not looking down on ourselves, but it's looking up to something bigger than ourselves. Beautiful, thank you. So I talked about looking down at ourselves, self-pity or inferiority. That is also, that is first of all unhealthy and that is also a negative self-centeredness. Some people think I am so great and some people think I am so bad. But we have to live with ourselves. And if we are, if we dislike ourselves, if we loathe ourselves, then it is worse than living with someone whom we dislike. Because we are living with ourselves whom we dislike. So we cannot look down at ourselves. And that's a, that positive self-understanding comes from spiritual knowledge. That we understand we are all parts of God. We are, 
They are potentially divine. And thus, we don't have to look down at ourselves. But look up at something bigger than ourselves means that we don't uh, we don't agitate about the wrongs in our life. Agitate for rights, claiming victimhood, claiming martyrdom, that, oh, no, this person did like this to me, that person did like this. All of life is tough. Everybody is working through their tragedies. And if you want to feel sorry for ourselves, the rest of our life is not enough for it. Uh, setting the wrongs right will not bring as much meaning to our life as taking up a responsibility. At a basic level, taking up responsibility means taking up responsibility for ourselves. Now, I have some strengths, I have some weaknesses. So let me take responsibility to do the best that I can do in my situation. So spiritual, the, the spiritual knowledge helps us to understand that we have a eternal purpose for us. That is spiritual evolution. To grow in our wisdom, to grow in our maturity, intellectually and emotionally to grow, and then to ultimately grow in our capacity to love. To love the eternal, to love Krishna, and to connect with everyone in the, in, in the light of that relationship. So that brought us to the second definition of humility. Does anyone remember that? Yes. Yes, to not let our ego come in the way of our purpose. So, some people are lost, they don't have any purpose. And some people are so lost that they don't even know they are lost. And that's like somebody busily going, uh, driving a car, where? To fuel. What after that? Next gas station. Next gas station. So, that's no purpose. You know, food, sleep, sex, power. These things are what we what we live with. That's not what we live for. So our purpose has to be something bigger. It's more not about what we get, but what about what we contribute, what we connect with, how we grow. So that purpose is, if we don't have that purpose, then what happens? If we don't have anything to fight for, we will fight for anything. So then in a small things can become big. Sometimes if somebody enters into a relationship simply for pleasure, then even a small thing which 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 displeases us, displeases that person, they can that can escalate and they can terminate that relationship over the small thing. So that's why we need something big in our life. And that spiritual knowledge says that we all are parts of God. We are all meant to contribute and connect in our life. Then I talked about the example of Hanuman. How he did not try to prove that he was stronger than Simbika, but he just focused on his purpose. And thus, by not, so our purpose is not necessarily to defeat those who oppose us. Our purpose is not to prove our power, but to pursue our destination, to go progress towards our destination. So that if for going towards that destination, sometimes if we are disrespected, we can accept that also. So that was the second definition of humility. And third was, then you remember? We should not take others' actions personally. Yes, don't take others' actions personally. That means, that I, I give the example of how of that dyslexic person just hitting someone or inside every uh, complaining adult is a crying infant. So when people hurt us, most often it is not about us. They have a movie going on in their head and that they are stars and we are all extras over there. So some, based on whatever is going on in their head, they hit out at us. Now, rather than taking it personally, uh, if we take it personally and we, we react to that, and then they react to what we have spoken and it just gets aggravated. Instead of that, try to understand what is the need, what is the unfulfilled need that is there making this person speak like this. Now, of course, it's up to us then to decide whether I want to fulfill that need or I feel this is too, I can't do this. I don't want to get into this. But either way, we can keep small things small by understanding that people's actions frequently are not about us. It's about what is going on in their head. And then I concluded by how uh, humility, when we don't take others' actions personally, then that doesn't mean we let them walk over us, but rather we stay focused on the purpose. Like if you're pushed by someone in the tree, we may just move aside, but if they're pushed out of the tree, then we take a stand. So if we keep the small thing small, but if it's a big thing, then we take a stand. And that way, humility can become an asset for us for pursuing our purpose and keeping healthy boundaries in the relationship 
while also helping the relationship to grow. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Yes, please. Hare Krishna. Uh, Prabhupada, you were saying in the beginning, that on the first point, and that we don't put ourselves down. This is not humility. And we hear in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, what Krishna says, on the Brahma Bhuta platform, the spiritual platform, uh, there is no lamentation. Of course, we understand that this is material lamentation, because we hear mm. all the Acharyas like lamenting, spiritually lamenting, like I have no Okay, lamentation. yeah, good question. What so, is the difference between Yeah, so when we say that the and we hear great saints, they they say that I am so fallen, I am utterly unworthy, I am more sinful than the greatest of sinners. So, the self-realized souls don't lament. Then how do we understand this? Are they looking down at themselves? Not exactly. And I would say not at all, in fact. Their reference point is completely different. Their reference point is Krishna. Is And in if they focus on Krishna and they feel he's so good, he's so loving, he is he's blessed me with so much. And in reciprocation, what have I done? I have done nothing. So in the light of that, when they are seeing Krishna's love flooding into their hearts and their lives, they feel I have done nothing to reciprocate. So and then they feel, oh I am so unworthy. But for us, we don't feel Krishna's love reciprocating into our hearts. We don't have that reference point. It's like say if you are if you are flying in a plane, and then if you sit in the on the window seat where the plane's wings are, and then you look out from there, the plane seems to be like going over a straw in the sky. It's, it's, it seems to be going so slowly because what is happening? The reference point is so big, the sky is so vast. It's only when you look down and then you can see if you are so, and if you can see the ground below visible and you can see the buildings and the roads, you say you're zooming through the sky. So for a person who is in the sky and looking at the plane, for them the, it may appear the plane is not moving at all. But for us in the ground, we see the plane moving super fast. So similarly, when they the great saints are at that level of consciousness, where they are perceiving Krishna's love flooding in their life. And as compared to how much Krishna loves them, they feel, I have done nothing. That's why they feel so bad about themselves. But even among, even with this expression also, ultimately, their, their determination to, to devote themselves to Krishna and Krishna, I have no hope except you. Therefore, I surrender to you. So in that sense, it's not discouraging or disconnecting them from Krishna. So for us, we have to focus primarily on where we are and how best we can become conscious of Krishna. Okay? Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please. So your third point you said you don't take other section personally. So does it mean that emotionally rather intellectually and contemplate on that? Okay. Good question. Uh, what does it mean to not take other's actions personally? It doesn't mean be impersonal. It doesn't mean that we don't care for them. It just means that mm, we see beyond the immediate action to try to understand what is driving that action. As much as possible. So we have to use our intelligence. We have to use our background knowledge about that person. And sometimes the inference that we may draw might also be wrong. But the problem is that if we, we had, if we say that by thinking also I can draw wrong inference. That's possible. But even without thinking also I, I might draw wrong inference. Isn't it? So that means what? That is somebody, I see somebody racing at me and they raise their hands. Oh, beat me. I might get alarmed. And I might be about to hit them back, hit back at them. But then I find that uh, they are hitting somebody who's coming from behind who's about to hit me. Now I don't understand that I might hit back at them. So see, generally, whenever anybody does something, we immediately, even unthinkingly, we attribute some motivation for them. Somebody is yelling, this is a short-term purpose. 
or when this person is angry with me. So we we anyway do some attribution for every action, but it's better that that attribution be more consciously contemplated rather than just unconsciously just uh, unconsciously dreamed. So sometimes somebody may be yelling. That might be because miss they are angry with us, or that might they might be in pain because they are hurt or something like that. We don't know. So it doesn't. That's what just try to understand. Try to why they are acting the way they are acting. Thank you. Yes, please. Well, I'm just thinking. Karmically speaking, when something happens to us, we should see this as something we deserve from our past actions, right? So then, through other people, uh, that reaction is coming. So, but then if we act on that. If we see it as it's that person doing it, and we act on that, we become more implicated. Okay. We act on impulsively. So yes. That vision. That vision. Yeah. Okay. This is a whole big subject. Maybe I'll address it briefly here. But should we see that if somebody is, if somebody is hurting us, it is our own past karma coming through that person, and we, that is one way we can not take their actions personally. That, yeah, you know, probably I did something bad and that's what is coming back to me. Yes, that's a valid and uh, valid way of looking at it and scripture often talks about it. But at the same time, we have to see things in proper context. Actually, this was going to be that theme of my, one of my future talks, but I'll mention it briefly here. See, everything that happens, we can put it in various contexts. We can put it in various frameworks. <coughs> say, for example, say if this tube goes off, Right now, if that tube goes on. We might just turn it on. Has somebody accidentally leaned against the switch? Has they turned off the switch? So we could. At, this tube has gone off because that switch was turned off. Or we could say maybe that tube has got spoiled. That's another reference. A third could be that oh, have all the lights gone off? Has the power gone off in the house? Or you could go. Has the power gone off in that locality? Or you could escalate it further. Is Has Canada been attacked by terrorists and the power plant has gone down? All power plants have gone down. Or you could escalate it further and say, has a solar flare from the sun come into the Earth's atmosphere? <laughs> no, it is. It, there is a there is a possibility every once in a century that solar flares which come out from the sun they might come into the Earth's atmosphere, and if they come into the Earth's atmosphere, all electrical and electronic equipment will stop functioning. So it it is something which you can't do anything about. My point is that we every small incident we could place it in different contexts. So intelligence means to place things in the most constructive context. It's not a matter of right or wrong. It's most constructive context. So what would be a constructive context? Say if on a cold night somebody eats ten ice creams. Mm -hmm. And then the next morning they wake up, and then they say, "I scream." <laughs> <laughs> Now, if they are having a horrible throat and a horrible mm, health condition, now is that because of their past karma? <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Yes, it is a past night's karma. Yes, it is. So the point is that if you can find an immediate cause for that, there is no need to go to the cause of past karma, isn't it? So you know, if somebody had told us to do something and we forgot to do it, and they are upset with us. I think they are upset with us with me because of my past karma. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> there is no need to escalate that to the level of past karma because it's my recent karma only. But what I forgot to do. So you know, if we start attributing, escalating everything to past karma, we won't be able to function in day to day life. Say, if I come here and I'm giving a class, and say I start speaking in Hindi over here, or I start speaking in some language which none of you understand. And one by one, all the audience starts walking away. And then I start thinking, oh, why did the audience walk away? It is my past karma. 
<laughs> so no. So yes. So basically, we start with the most obvious frame of reference. So then, if that frame of reference doesn't make sense, then we look at some other frame of reference. So then, when we look at the other frame of reference, so one such frame of reference, expanded frame of reference, is past karma. That means sometimes you know, we are behaving quite reasonably. None of us is perfect, but still, if we are behaving reasonably with another person, and another person is being completely unreasonable with us, then. It's like we did not do anything to set them off, but still they are they're madly against us. Then what happens? It may be that it's nothing that we have done and nothing we can correct. So at that time we can say that okay, this was because of past karma. So past karma needn't need not to what is the word needed? It shouldn't be the first explanation that we go to. If that becomes the first explanation, then we can miss out and more practical explanation because it's a past karma. What can I do? I can tolerate, but it's not to be tolerated. It has to be corrected. If I have done something wrong right now, and of course, even if it is past karma, now again there are limits. We see that the Pandavas in the Ram Mahabharat, uh, they tolerated the Kauravas' wrongdoings up to a particular point. Even when they were poisoned, they tolerated it. Even when they were exiled, they were they tolerated it. Even when they were, uh, uh, even when they were attempted to be burned alive, they tolerated it. But when Draupadi was dishonored, they decided not to do it. And not only that, after that, when they came back after staying in exile, and there was no repentance, there was no reformation, there was no desire even for accommodation. So when the when Krishna came, what happened is that the Pandavas. Uh, on behalf of the Pandavas, and he said, "Just give five villages." And what did Duryodhan say? Does anyone know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, I will not give enough land through which you can put the tip of a needle. But there are different ways of saying no. Sometimes, suppose we invite somebody for a program. And then they say, actually, I'm busy, so I can't come. For, I have this engagement that evening, so I can't come for the program. That might be true. That might not be true. Also, some people may make it up. But at least they're giving some, some reason. But if that person says, even if I die, even my corpse will not come for your program. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is not just. <laughs> <laughs> that is not just a no uh, to that invitation. That's like a no banging in the nose of the person, the face of the person, isn't it? So Duryodhan, when he said no like this, it was the height of arrogance. So then the Pandava said, "You say no, you can't tolerate this." He decided to mediate it. He decided to counter it. So even when something is being done because of past karma, the idea is that. We don't want to complicate things by uh, our actions in this car, in this life. But if somebody's inimical actions are preventing us from doing anything at all, are completely choking us, then you know we can't just attribute it to past karma and stay passive. Uh, as I said, it's a big subject, but I'll just make one point to conclude this. Okay. See, uh, there are there is a difference between in, in attitudes between you could say Eastern cultures and Western cultures. Western culture. So Eastern by Western also I mean uh, post scientific revolution Western. You know, if you look at Shakespeare's Macbeth or others, much of the way characters think is very similar to the way Eastern thought was. But so the Western idea is that current Western idea you could say the last 400 500 years is that. Broadly speaking, there is no world beyond this world. There is no life beyond this life. So whatever has to be done has to be done in this world and this life. So any problem, change it. Any problem, change change the externals. Now in the Eastern cultures, there is a there is a bigger picture. It is beyond this world. So any problem, adjust yourself, tolerate it. So you could say that. 
the eastern culture is more of culture of tolerance western culture is the more culture of change now both of these when you take them to extremes it becomes a problem now if tolerance is taken to too much extreme that can lead to passivity it can make one subject to abuse too much tolerance is also not desirable on the other hand too much change that leads to no capacity to commit oneself and then that also leads to a lot of instability so there there certainly all of us need we need to grow in our capacity to tolerate but tolerance is not the supreme virtue we have a purpose in life our spiritual growth our contribution in life that purpose is what we want to keep at the center of our life and while pursuing the purpose there are times we tolerate and there are times we sometimes mitigate also we counter also so that's why the karma past karma is definitely a factor to consider but we look at shila prabhupad's life i, I mentioned earlier that shila prabhupad was in india and in jhansi tried to start a temple and somehow a clique was formed against him and people who were supporting him conspired against him and they said you have to leave now prabhupad had the legal deed for the place and prabhupad could have gone to court and fought for this prabhupad felt it was not worth it he said he decided that jhansi was anyway not a very big city and his spiritual master had said that you know, we can open centers in a big city so this and people also they were not very committed at least other people who were supporting also not very committed they are more pious than spiritual religious than spiritual so he said it's not worth fighting but later on when he got the land in juhu juhu in mumbai that is in a quite a prom, quite in a now it's a prominent location that's the place where many of uh, bollywood stars stay <coughs> so bollywood is the indian equivalent of hollywood and it's very prestigious but that time it was potential not in not grown but so there was a person who gave them the land he took the money and then he was not able to give the land deeds he tried to use goons and threaten and use political backstabbing and all sort of thing he tried to do and at that time prabhupad fought he said i will over my dead body this person will get the land as my profession over my dead body i was not It fought at that time, so uh, his focus was on the purpose. This is a, a land in Juhu. It would be a wonderful way to share Krishna's message. So it's a, it was a, something worth fighting for, and he fought for it. I just yesterday, yesterday I was talking with His Holiness Giriraj Maharaj. He has just completed a, a book on that Juhu Prabhupada told him to write about the Juhu project. He has completed a 600 book page, magnificent book. on a promise fulfilled and a temple i shall it's called it it's called i shall i will build your temple that was the promise that prabhupad made to the other aspiring deities so how we did that so prabhupad fought also at times so do we attribute every every <coughs> unreasonable behavior of others painful behavior to past karma not as well we have to look at our present situation also and do we accept it passively as past karma not necessarily if it is interfering with our purpose then we have to we have to deal with it appropriately but if it is a small thing then we better tolerate it and move on with the big things in life is answer your question thank you so any last questions any last question or questions okay